faculty attend, I mean not attend, but come to the class. But if, it, if I'm at the minimum point, then I'll probably not come to the class, I'll cancel the class. So I'll let you know Friday morning whether the class is cancelled or not. Is it recording? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing I know, my joke became viral. Any questions on the assignment? You have a question? Would you yeah. Say like optimal, is that just local minimum? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When I say global minimum, then you have to assume it's a global minimum, okay. is what I'm asking for. But Any other question on the assignment? No? Has any has any one of you tried the assignment question? No? Okay, first two. You know, I'll I'll give you an advice. So since you are in grad school, not grad school, but you are taking a grad course, the key to being on top of things in grad courses is start doing the homework the day it is assigned and perhaps finish it the next day when it is assigned and not wait until the last minute. So if this becomes your habit, you will succeed with flying colors in grad school. If not, things will become very difficult later on. That has been my experience and also the experience of my friends who have completed their PhD. So something to keep in mind. <coughs> we'll start in about uh, a minute. Okay, let's get started. So we were discussing about convex functions and optimal solutions of convex functions. So the setting is f r into r is convex and the theorem was x star global minimum if and only if gradient of fx star equal to 0. Okay, so all you need to check for convex function is the first derivative condition and that is sufficient for establishing global minimum. So embedded within this, uh, in this particular theorem is the following fact. So x star is a local minimum implies x star is a global minimum. Okay, and this is what we were trying to prove in the previous class. So let's try and uh, prove this fact first and then we'll go ahead and prove this result. So. The inequality we had was let y star be the global minimum. Alpha in 0, 1. And consider 
f of alpha x plus 1 minus alpha y or x star y star yeah and I know from convexity that this is less than alpha of f x star plus 1 minus alpha of f y star which is strictly less than f of x star. So note that in alpha, this is closed bracket and this is open parentheses. So both x star and y star are local and global minimum? No, x star is a local minimum by hypothesis and y star is a global minimum. But the fact uh, told us that if it is a local minimum, then it is a global minimum. That's what we want to prove. Uh -huh. Okay. So x star is a local minimum implies x star is a global minimum. So suppose x star is not a global minimum and y star not equal to x star is a global minimum. I pick alpha in 0, 1 and I compute this expression and it turns out that it is less than x star, okay. For values of alpha very, very close to 1, the point, this particular point uh, is close to x star, right, if alpha is close to 1. So alpha uh, equal to 1 implies this point is close to x star, which means that x star is not a local minimum, okay. Because by definition of a local minimum, there has to be a neighborhood and it has to be minimum in that particular neighborhood. So let's try and see by, by picture what is happening. This is my x star and this is some y star that is a global minimum and I draw a line and what I prove here is that along this line all the points have value which is strictly less than fx star. So if I pick a point here, x, my f of x is strictly less than f of x star, right? And this is true for every point on this line, which means that x star cannot be a local minimum, okay? So there is a contradiction. It leads to a contradiction to the hypothesis that x star is a local minimum. Therefore, x star need necessarily has to be a global minimum. Okay, is the argument clear? Okay, so what am I doing? I want to prove that A implies B. I assume A, I assume not B, and I show that this leads to contradiction. This implies that A, this particular statement is equivalent to saying that A implies B. Okay, is that clear? All right. Now I want to go back to this particular theorem and there is if and only if, so I have to prove the theorem both ways. So one way is easy. Let's try to prove it this way. If X star is global minimum, then first order necessary condition implies that gradient of f at x star has to be equal to 0. Okay, so one side is easy. What should the argument for the other side be? So the other side is if the derivative is 0, then x star is a global minimum. Okay, so let's try and prove it this way. If 
Any thoughts? Yes. Taylor series expansion. You are close, but not there yet. You have some thoughts? Yeah. The second derivative, do you mean? Okay. Uh, not really, because that only shows, that only gives you a local result. It doesn't give you global result. This is a global result. So, so remember, we had three definitions of convexity, right? So definition one was this definition of convexity, okay? What was definition two? It was related to the first derivative of the function, right? So f is convex implies that f of y is greater than or equal to f of x star plus gradient of fx star transpose y minus x star, right? This was one of the definitions of convexity. Now, what happens when this term is equal to zero? f of y is, by the way, this holds for all y in Rn. So if gradient of fx star is equal to zero, I get that f of y is greater than or equal to f of x star, which is the definition of global minimum. So gradient of fx star equals to zero implies fy is greater than or equal to fx star for all y in Rn. Okay, questions? So let's look at a convex function. It looks like this. It looks differentiable, so therefore it is differentiable. And I pick two point, x star, y star, both of which our local minimum. So by the first, by this fact, these two points are global minimum. Uh, the derivative is equal to zero. And also, the line that joins these two global minimum, every point in that line is also a global minimum. Okay? So you pick two global minimum and you draw the line joining these two global minimum, and that line segment, every point in that line segment is also a global minimum for the original convex function. Okay. So these are some uh, properties of uh, convex functions, and why it is important will become clear by the end of this class, okay? So the, we are now going to discuss gradient descent methods for unconstrained optimization. And hopefully by the end of the class, when I, talk, when I tell you about the convergence property of gradient descent algorithms, you will realize why this theorem is very, very important in optimization. So I'm going to remove everything else from the board and I'm going to start our discussion on gradient descent algorithms. Okay. I have a function like this. I'm sitting at a point x, and I want to go in a direction where the function reduces. The value of the function reduces, right? That's the way to go to the minimum. So if you're standing on a hill, you want to get to the bottom. You always want to take a step in a direction where the height of the 
mountain is reducing, right? You don't want to go up and then get to the valley. So that's what we want to do. Some, we want to do something similar here. So the question is find direction D such that f of x plus d is less than f of x. That's our goal. Let's try and do a Taylor series expansion of this particular function. So I have f of x, f of x plus d equals to f of x plus d transpose gradient of f of x plus small o of norm of d square. Which one? This is d? O of norm of d square. So this, this error term will be proportional to the norm of d. Yeah, so the first order is appearing fine. Oh, this should be, this is, is this what you are saying? Yeah, I think you are correct, yeah. It's norm of t. Okay. So if I pick d sufficiently small, I know that this term is negligible, right? But what about this term? How about I pick d equals minus gradient of fx scaled by a parameter alpha so that it's the norm of d is very, very small. Then this term is negligible and this term is strictly negative, right? So f of x plus d is strictly less than f of x as far as this alpha, parameter alpha is sufficiently small. Okay, that's the key idea in gradient descent method. The idea is if I use the negative of the gradient of the function f and I take a small step in that direction, the first order Taylor series says that I'm going to reduce the value of my function. Okay? Yes? Does this step size alpha need to be small? So even if we take alpha greater than one, then the inequality still holds. Still holds. It will hold as long as this term is negligible in comparison to this. Because this term could be positive, so this term is strictly negative. If you pick alpha sufficiently large, this term would become so positive that it will negate the effect of this negative value. Okay, so that's why alpha has to be small. So I'm, when I say a small, one could be small enough for the function that you are trying to minimize. But, uh, uh, but sometimes you have to pick alpha as a small number, which, is, which could be 10 raised to minus four, it could be 10 raised to minus two, it could be uh, even one or two uh, in some problems. So it really depends on the properties of the function. And in order to find the value of alpha that's going to work out for your problem, you have to do some trial and error. Okay, so is the idea of gradient descent clear? Okay, use negative of gradient of fx in an intelligent manner to find the direction d. So this motivates us to define the gradient descent method as follows. So I'm going to pick x naught in Rn arbitrarily. Just pick zero, just pick zero vector or whatever, some random vector. And then define xk plus one equals xk minus alpha k dk gradient of fxk, where alpha k greater than zero is small step size and dk 
is positive definite. That's the idea. Yeah, I'll I'll go over in it in a bit. Okay. So I hope you are convinced that by adding a, or multiplying the gradient with a positive definite matrix, our conclusion here still holds because D-transpose gradient of Fx would be strictly negative even if uh, I pick DK to be a positive definite matrix. So I'm fine. The conclusion still holds. And now what are we doing uh, pictorially? So let's say I have a function, I want to minimize it. This is f equals to 1, this is f equals to 2, I'm st and this is your x star. This is where your x star would lie in the space. So these are the contour lines, okay? So where the function value is constant, the points, or points x at which the function value is constant. So I'm standing here. This is my point x, and my this is my gradient of fx, or rather negative of gradient of fx. If I pick alpha equals 1, then this would be my, let me write this as minus gradient of fx. This point is x minus gradient of fx, okay? So if I pick alpha equals to 1, I'm going to reach here. I'm going to arrive at this particular point at which the value of function is larger than what it was before, okay? How about if I pick alpha equals 1 half, okay? So I will be here. Uh, so this point is x x minus half gradient of fx and certainly we have reduced the value of function by some amount because we are inside the contour however if we pick this particular point x minus 1 over 3 gradient of fx we get the maximum reduction in the function value okay we are closest to x star in this case. So there is some amount of trade-off you need to make in order to figure out what, the good, what a good step size for this problem would be. But this is precisely what we are doing. We are sitting at x, I look at the direction, negative gradient of fx sitting at x, and I pick an appropriate step size where, which, so that I feel that I'm closest to x star by picking that particular step size. So in this case, step size 1 over 3, alpha equals 1 over 3 seems to make most sense. Now, what if I multiply it by a positive definite matrix? Okay, so a positive definite matrix tends to rotate a vector and it also tends to scale a vector, okay? So in this case, just worry about the rotation because we are using alpha to scale the vector. So just worry about the rotation here and I multiply it by a positive definite matrix. And what I get is, this is your my vector minus D 
gradient of f x. So this is my direction. And as you can see, if, if again I pick an appropriate value of alpha, I will be at this particular point, which is much closer to x star in comparison to this point. OK? Yes? Yeah, so the, it'll be, so gradient will be orthogonal in the increasing dimension, so the gradient will be something like this. Yeah, so. Yeah, so negative fx will point in the opposite direction. Well, okay, I haven't drawn it perfectly, but, uh, but that's the idea. So gradient, so this would be your gradient of fx, which will be normal to this, the tangent here. And so negative of gradient will be exactly in the opposite direction. And multiplying it by a positive definite matrix will rotate this vector. Now, just any positive definite matrix is not good because you could also rotate the vector in this direction. So you have to judiciously pick an appropriate positive definite matrix so that you get closer to x star in the next iteration. Okay. So that's the picture for gradient descent method. So now our problem is, there are two things to play with here. One is the step size and one is the positive definite matrix. So the question is, what is an appropriate choice for step size and what is an appropriate choice for the positive definite matrix? So let's look at appropriate choices for positive definite matrix. The simplest algorithm is dk equals to identity. And this method is known as steepest descent. So I pick identity matrix at all points of time. And that was this method, steepest descent method. So this just goes on to say that even if we don't pick a definite, positive definite matrix. We'll identity is a positive definite matrix. Okay. It has the same eigenvalue along all directions. So this is still within this framework. So the goal is we want to use dk to like rotate it towards? Towards x star, yeah. That's the goal. So you want to find dk which will rotate it towards x star. OK? The next method is Newton's method. dk equals negative second derivative of fxk inverse. Oh, uh, sorry. Just the second derivative inverse. No negative sign. OK. So naturally, if you, are, if you are in a convex function domain, you know that this is positive semi-definite. Uh, and if you have a strictly convex function, then it will be positive definite, so you might be good. But in many cases, the problem is you may have situation where this is not positive definite, so this condition does not hold. So in which case, you would you would try to add some sort of positive definite matrix to it plus some beta identity inverse. You will pick beta appropriately high so that this whole term becomes a positive definite matrix and then you invert it. This will be a modified form of Newton's method. Yes. 
Ah, why do we need dk to be positive definite? We want this term to be strictly negative, right? So if my d is equal to negative second de negative dk or negative d into gradient of fx, then d transpose gradient of fx equals to gradient of fx transpose d gradient of fx with a negative sign. And so if d is positive definite, I'm guaranteed that this is going to be negative, strictly negative, as long as gradient of fx is not equal to 0. Right? Yes? Is that modification trying to make it positive definite, or is it trying to make it imperfect? Like, is there ever a possibility where it would be non imperfect? I mean, yes. So how about a convex function x transpose 1, 0, 0, 1, no, 1, 0, 0, 0, x. So this is a convex function, OK? But uh, it's not positive definite. The second derivative is not positive definite. And you can make any uh, matrix positive definite by adding a Yeah, so you already know that this is symmetric. All you have to do is, yeah, you can add a sufficiently high magnitude of multiplied by identity matrix and it become positive definite. Why would you not always want to go in the Ah, so we will study, perhaps in the next class, the properties of Newton's method, and it turns out to rotate the vector towards x star always. Okay, so the convergence is extremely fast for Newton's method. Okay, so if it takes one million steps to converge using descent, gradient descent, it will only take a uh, 500 iterations to converge using Newton's method. Okay, so it's, it's that fast. But what's the problem? Inverting this matrix, so computing this matrix and inverting it at every point of time. That's the problem. Okay, and usually that takes more time in some applications. There was a question, yeah. Uh, is the second derivative of uh, FSK does not have any inverse? So it will not have an inverse only if it has a zero eigenvalue. So you can always add identity matrix, and you can move the eigenvalue towards positive half space. What is the value of beta? Sorry? Sorry? What is the value of beta? Some large number. Large number. Yeah. Yes? Uh, How is the inverse of uh, 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 this DK uh, positive definite? Oh, so inverse of a positive definite matrix is also positive definite. Uh, why is that? Because Inverse of positive definite matrix, the eigenvalues are 1 over lambda 1, 1 over lambda n. So if lambda 1 to lambda n is positive, then of course 1 over lambda 1 to 1 over lambda n is also positive. So we'll be using Newton's method mainly for data sets which are of lower dimension, yes. less number of points. Yes, and also if the second derivative is easy to compute. Okay. So you could have second derivative that is very hard to compute. Okay. Any other question? No? Okay, so second derivative is hard to compute. Inverting an, a, a matrix of dimension n cross n is also hard. How about diagonally scaled scaled Newton's method. And here, I'm going to pick dk to be diagonal of second derivative with respect to x1, Okay, so I just pick, pick the diagonal elements of this matrix and invert it. Okay, that's diagonally scaled Newton's method.
Okay. So, what if the second derivative is positive definite? No, positive semi definite. Positive semi definite. Yeah. So, for that we had this algorithm here, so you have to appropriately add constant also, yeah. Should add so that so as to make it positive definite. I mean, all of these algorithms will only work if dk is positive definite. If it is not positive definite, there is no guarantee of convergence. So, you may converge in some specific instances, but there is no guarantee that you will always converge in all problems. <coughs> now, think about situations where the second derivative doesn't really change much if you move around the space. So then, you could use modified Newton's method where you pick dk to be second derivative at x0 inverse. Okay. My second derivative doesn't change if I move around. So, why to invest the effort in computing this inverse at every point of time? Just do it once, run your algorithm for 100 iterations and then recompute it, okay? Or just do it once and forget about it. Never recompute it again, right? So that's going to reduce the computational overhead for your optimization problem. Yes? Uh, what is the benefit of using diagonally scaled Newton's method? So this is, so all these, so anything, so Newton's method is the best method possible. Well, not the best method possible, but this is the one that is very well known and has very strong convergence guarantee. However, because of the computational complexity, you want to minimize on computation as much as possible. So these are all ways to minimize computation. Okay. And the good thing is, people may have tried many, many other methods, but these methods turn out to have superior performance in comparison to other methods that they have tried. The fifth is discretized Newton's method. where you pick dk to be hk inverse and hk is, oh, dk equals to hk inverse and hk is an approximate value of the second derivative of the function. Okay. So there are different formulas for computing derivatives approximately. So the simplest case is if you want to find x, f prime of x, you essentially add a small number, subtract fx, divided by h, right? So all of you have used this before or have seen this before, right? You can use the same thing for multivariate functions, okay? And find the second derivative. That will give you an approximate value of, oh, this is not equal. This is approximate. So you can get an approximate value of the second derivative, take the inverse, that's your discretized Newton's method. Okay? Any questions so far? These are ways to select the positive definite matrix dk.
for gradient descent. Now we need to figure out how to select alpha k. So before I proceed, if there are any questions, just let me know now. Okay. So let's look at how to figure out, how to pick an appropriate value of alpha k. So let me just continue writing here. So the first is minimization rule. Where alpha k is argmin alpha greater than 0, f of x k plus alpha b k. Okay. Uh, so throughout this discussion, my dk is minus dk, capital dk, gradient of fxk. Okay. So I'm standing at x, I have picked the uh, direction dk that I want to go in and then I solve a minimization problem over a scalar to identify at what point the function value is minimized along this particular line. Okay. We will use this uh, method in one of the uh, one of the optimization problems we will study in the future. So the second is limited minimization rule. Alpha k equals to argmin alpha in 0 comma s f of xk plus alpha tk. What this f? S. S is some parameter you pick. 5, 10, 20, 100, 1000. Okay. Then the third is Armijo's rule. So this is a little complicated, a, a bit complicated rule. Uh, so your alpha k equals to beta s beta raised to m k, where s is in zero one, beta is in. 0, 1 and mk is the smallest integer, smallest uh, natural number such that f of xk minus
okay so this is a step size reduction so this is a step size reduction formula so you start with say m equals to 0 and you check whether this condition is satisfied or not so sigma is let's say between 0 and 1 or yeah sigma could be say 10 raised to minus 3 10 raised to minus 2 10 raised to minus 1 and so on so you want to make sure that your function decreases sufficiently uh, in comparison to the step size that you have picked. So initially you start with a very long step size. You check if this condition is satisfied or not. If it is satisfied, great. You pick that as your step size, alpha k. If not, you increase the value of m by 1. You look at whether this condition is satisfied or not. So your step size is s beta now. Right? It will appear here and in this equation. Again, if it is not satisfied, you scale it back again and then look for a new value of uh, m for which this condition would be satisfied. And the idea is, again, you want to make sure that your function decreases by a certain quantity before you actually pick that particular step size. And this is known as Armijo's rule. Okay, so you will implement Armijo's rule in one of your assignments. Any question on this? Okay. Fourth, constant step size. Alpha k equals to c. Okay, constant step size is the simplest uh, algorithm because you don't have to uh, do any fancy computation. Just use a constant number. So C equals to 0 0.1, 0 0.01 or whatever value works for your optimization problem. The issue with constant step size is it requires some experience uh, to figure out what the constant step size should be. Okay, so if I give you the first optimization problem, you will have to spend some effort to figure out what should the step size be. But once you have invested that effort, you will have some knowledge, some experience in running those algorithms. And then you can, in the future, run similar optimization problems with similar step sizes and things will work out completely fine. So some amount of prior knowledge is needed. For this, this, and this, you don't need any prior knowledge, okay? No matter what function I give you, no matter what algorithm I give you, or what way of picking dk I give you, you can run one, two, and three without any problem. You don't need to know, you don't need to have experience, okay? So maybe first year graduate student should just stick to this point. And second year onwards, you can move on to constant step size. Okay, so by that time you will have some experience. The fifth is diminishing step size. And here, alpha k goes to zero, summation of alpha k equals infinity, summation of alpha k square is finite. Okay, so these are the three conditions that alpha k needs to satisfy for diminishing step size algorithms. So one choice for diminishing step size algorithm is alpha k equals 1 over k raised to 0 0.5 plus delta. Just put some constants on top. I don't care. C 
see. Okay, delta has to be a positive, small positive number. No, not small, it can be any positive number. Uh, so in this case, it's not summable, which means the summation of alpha k is equal to infinity. But summation of alpha k square is finite, and alpha k goes to zero as k goes to infinity. Okay, yes? What's the reason for that alpha k squared condition being less than infinity? Yeah. Uh, so let's let's assume that uh, so I'm trying to come up with a argument which is not very mathematical, and I'm not able to come up with that argument. Okay, so I'll tell you what the mathematical argument is. So. You know about mean and variance, okay? You must have studied it in some probability class, right? So the reason why people started studying diminishing step size algorithms was in the context of stochastic optimization algorithms. And there, you want to make sure that you can span the entire space by taking long step sizes, but you want to make sure that the variance of your iterates is finite at every point of time. And so if this term goes to infinity, then your variance may go to infinity for stochastic optimization algorithms. And then, of course, this trickled into deterministic optimization as well. Okay. I'm yet to see a paper which says, or which comes up with pathological cases where if this goes to infinity, things go wrong. Uh, so you see what I'm saying is, for this, there are lots of papers that proves convergence. Without this, I have not seen any single paper which says, oh, here is a pathological example and you see things going to infinity. So, Okay. I have 10 more minutes. 10 minutes? No, I have 5 minutes. Okay. So let's try and figure out under what conditions. So, so now what I've given you is a laundry list of uh, ways you can pick dk and ways you can pick alpha k. So for every possible choice of dk and alpha k, you have a new gradient descent algorithm, like a brand new gradient descent algorithm. And the question is under what, con under what conditions would it converge? And here is the technical condition. fairly general technical condition. So dk, this is the definition. dk is gradient related to xk if and only if. the following holds. If xk converges to x bar such that gradient f at x bar is not equal to zero, then limpsup k goes to infinity gradient fxk transpose dk is less than zero. And dk is bounded. So k goes to infinity. This soup? 
Oh, so this is limb soup. Limb soup means I have a sequence. I look at the upper envelope of the sequence, right? And I see where that upper envelope converges to. That's limb soup, okay? So this is a sequence. It need not converge to anything, right? So it will have, and this is a scalar. So if I plot the graph, some points will be here, some points will be here, some points will be here. I look at the upper envelope of the entire sequence, and I look at the limit of the upper envelope. Okay, the limit always exists. That's limb soup. And I want the upper envelope to converge to a point that is strictly negative. Okay, which means, so if the upper envelope converges to a point that is say minus five, then it means everything is below minus five, right? This is the meaning of the gradient relative. This is the meaning. This is the definition. Okay. I don't know who came up with such a name, but somebody did, and so we all are studying gradient relatedness. Okay, so the, the result is, and it's, the proof is pretty sophisticated and given in Bertzicker's book, but the result is that if dk is gradient related to xk, so most of these algorithms will lead to dk that is gradient related to xk unless either your gradient of f is blowing up or dk is blowing up. Okay, so you don't want this term to blow up, you don't want this term to blow up. Uh, if that is the case, then uh, and 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 then dk will be gradient related to xk, and in that case, your gradient descent algorithm will converge to a point. So, I want to write it more formally. So the result is. Lots of conditions, which includes gradient relatedness. But if xk converges to x bar, then gradient of f at x bar is equal to 0. OK? So what are these conditions? So the first condition is dk should be gradient related to xk based on the choice of algorithm you have picked. The second would be how you pick alpha k, so according to minimization, limited minimization, constant step size, or Armijo's rule. The third could be the function has to be Lipschitz continuous, shouldn't blow up in finite type, things like that. So there are some conditions which are usually satisfied in all problems that you would encounter, unless you are working on pathological problems. Uh, so if that is the case, and your algorithm seems to converge to a point, then it implies that the point is a stationary point, which means that the derivative of the function at that point is equal to 0. Okay. Now what happens if function f is convex? You converge to global minimum. What happens if your function f is not convex? No, you don't converge to local minimum because you still need to check the second order sufficiency condition to guarantee local minimality. You converge to a point and you don't know what that point is, so you need to do some additional work to, to ascertain whether that point is a local minimum or not. Okay, it's not obvious. So that's it and we'll meet on Friday if I feel better, okay.